You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, how can you generate energy from hot rocks? We find out about a new scheme at Cornwall's Eden Project. Why the food on your dinner table could be contributing to deforestation in the Amazon. And hitting the brakes on an electric future, MPs warn our roads aren't ready for a move to zero emission cars. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. Now, we talk a lot about renewable energy, such as wind and solar on this show, but now there could be a new kid on the block. Drilling has begun at the Eden Project in Cornwall as part of a scheme to produce geothermal energy using hot rocks in the Earth's granite crust to superheat water. Well, in a moment, we'll hear more from our science correspondent, Thomas Moore, who's in Cornwall. But first, what is geothermal energy? <laughs> So that's the theory, and the reality could soon be underway in the UK at the Eden Project. Thomas Moore reports. To grow a tropical rainforest in the Cornwall chill takes some energy, and in the search for a sustainable source of heat, the Eden Project is going underground. This 450-tonne drill is boring nearly three miles into the Earth's crust in search of hot rocks. Water that's pumped down then brought to the surface again could be superheated to 180 degrees. That's enough to generate all the electricity and heat that Eden needs, plus more for thousands of local homes. The argument from those who were anti-renewables was when the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine, you've got a problem. Now you haven't. This will provide you energy 24-7 when you want it to fill in for all the other energy sources. So it's a, tri a wonderful uh, triumvirate of power sources. It's taken 10 years and £17 million to get this drill in the ground, and it is that enormous upfront cost that has been the major deterrent to geothermal here in the UK. But the people behind this project believe they can produce energy for the same price as gas, but without the carbon. Geothermal energy is widely used on the continent and the costs are falling. But until the drill has done its work in five months' time, Eden's engineers can't be certain they can extract enough hot water. But the potential is so great, they believe it's well worth the risk. Thomas Moore, Sky News in Cornwall. Let's take a look now at some of the day's other climate news. And millions of UK homes are at increased risk of subsidence due to climate change. That's according to a study by the British Geological Survey. It suggests drier summers driven by global warming will cause the ground under houses to shrink and crack. Scientists estimate almost 2.4 million buildings could face problems by 2030 if action isn't taken. Extinction Rebellion activists have staged a protest outside the Science Museum in London. The campaigners want people to boycott its new climate exhibition as it's being sponsored by the oil company Shell. London Science Museum says it has a complete editorial control of its exhibitions, while Shell aims to be a net zero business by 2050. Scientists are warning that zombie fires could become more common as the climate changes. A report by Nature found warmer temperatures caused by global warming allows these underground fires to burn deeper into the soil, helping sustain them over winter. Zombie fires can survive cold seasons by smouldering in peat below frozen ground. The fires then reignite when the weather gets warmer in spring. 
Prince William's announced two young climate campaigners will be joining the judging panel of his £50 million Earthshot Prize. He says Louisa Neubauer and Ernest Gibson will bring much-needed youthfulness, expertise and activism. Ernest told Sky News the project is an opportunity to tackle climate change head-on. We can bring together some of the ideas, some of the drive, some of the passion from people all over the world to try and find solutions to the biggest environmental and ecological um, challenges that we face at the moment. Now, the world's biggest food businesses have all agreed not to buy soy from recently deforested Amazon land. But the Bureau of Investigative Journalism has found the Amazon rainforest is still being burnt to make way for soya to feed the world's livestock bread for the global meat industry. Now, between 70 and 90 percent of the world's soybean crop is used as animal feed. Brazil is the world's largest producer of soybeans, but vast areas of the Amazon have been deforested to make way for the crops, a practice that's meant to be illegal. But here in Mato Grosso, there's a problem. Fires are still being set to clear land for new planting. And here you can see the fire at one farm last July. Now, this is what that piece of farmland looked like in 2008. And here's what it looked like last year. Huge swathes of rainforest completely destroyed. Well, to help the land recover, local agencies prevent anything being grown or sold from the damaged parts. But it's claimed that crops are being farmed in those areas and passed off as coming from the adjacent sustainable land. Well, the investigation found that this soy is making its way into the global supply chain from Brazil to the US, the UK and China. Well, with me now is Sarah Lake, Vice President of Mighty Earth, a global campaign organisation that works to protect the environment. Welcome to you. Um, there are controls already in place designed to prevent the purchase of soil linked to deforestation. So what does this say about the effectiveness of those controls, do you think? Those controls exist. However, there are certainly large loopholes and we know that a lot of the deforestation is ending up in European markets. British shoppers are unknowingly contributing to destruction of the Amazon through the meat they're buying at their local supermarket. Major agribusinesses are wiping out the forest to grow soya to feed British chickens and pigs. And even though these controls exist and supermarkets are aware that there is illegality and fires and conversion in their supply chain, they continue to purchase from these companies. And we know that these supermarkets could take action. They could cut their ties with these companies that have illegality and forest fires but they continue to source from them. Meanwhile, as you mentioned, deforestation in the Amazon is hitting an all-time high. In the last year alone, the Amazon lost an area over 20 times the size of the new forest. Yet British supermarkets claim to take action, and we know these illegalities continue in the suppliers that are feeding British consumers these meat products. So what could be done? Well, first, we need uh, strong due diligence laws in the UK to limit the import of products linked to deforestation. But we also need stronger, uh, stronger action from the private sector, from European companies and British companies who actually show their suppliers they mean business, that they will not allow for deforestation to enter their supply chain. So we expect that these supermarkets drop companies that are deforesting rather than allowing them to continue business as usual, even when we have irrefutable evidence that these farms are being cleared to grow soya. Sarah Lake, thank you. The government doesn't have a clear plan to phase out petrol and diesel cars, according to a group of MPs. The Public Accounts Committee warned the target of banning the sale of internal combustion cars by 2030 could be missed and found the vehicles are still too expensive and there aren't enough charging points. And that's something the Transport and Environment Campaign Group says is a big problem. They've found that with sales of electric vehicles set to increase, the number of chargers being installed is lagging behind. Now, this is how close different regions are to having enough chargers by 2025. London, perhaps unsurprisingly, has already hit its target, and Scotland is at 82%. But in the southeast, under half of the required charges for the number of electric vehicles are installed. An extra 3,932 charges are needed 
by 2025. In the northeast, although the region has 68% of the required chargers installed, only an extra 395 chargers are needed by 2025 due to the lower number of electric vehicles expected in that area. Well, Greg Archer is the UK Director of Transport and Environment who produced that research. He joins me now. So, Greg Archer, the government maintains it has a plan. They call it an ambitious and world-leading approach to boosting the number of electric cars. So, are they on target or not, as far as you're concerned? The government have a target, but they don't have a plan at the present time. Um, they're relying on business to deliver the number of charge points uh, which are needed. And that means we're getting a very uneven distribution of those uh, charging devices around the UK with excellent coverage in some areas and, and negligible coverage in others. And if we're going to have a really successful phase out of diesel and petrol cars, we need to ensure there's comprehensive coverage around the UK. So do you think that's one of the main disincentives to people investing in an electric car, the fact that they can't rely on those charging points? What our research finds is that, in fact, the charging network is better than people without an electric car often imagine. But because of this very uneven distribution, people lack the confidence to go out and make the change to buy an electric car. We also know the electric cars are rather expensive at the present time, but we expect them to be the same price as petrol and diesel cars by around 2026. So that's only a few years time. Well, the government says it's, it's going to invest money, 1.3 billion, I think, over the next four years to get the infrastructure ready. What do you think needs to happen? Do you think that's enough money? Is that the issue? Now, I don't think the government needs to be spending money. What the government needs to be doing is coordinating the work of business to make sure that we have charge points across the UK. We need to, for example, get local authorities to start to employ charging officers who can start to coordinate to make sure there's enough charges in their areas. We need to legislate to make sure that car parks are actually equipped with chargers. What our research actually finds is that two thirds of the cars in the UK are parked in people's homes. They won't use the public charging network much at all. The other third of the cars, well, half of them will only need a top up charge once a week. So these cars don't need a charging point outside of every home, they can go to the supermarket or charge at work, charge at the station, wherever they leave their cars. Greg Archer, thanks very much indeed. Well, that's everything from us for today. Coming up tomorrow, it's a classic summer pastime, but could pick your own be under threat from climate change? You can catch that at the same time tomorrow here on Sky News. See you then.